idea of black culture co-opting has been around for decades. From Chuck Berry to Elvis. From the birth of R&B to New Age Pop. And African dance to modern day twerking. As black culture blends to gray, what permanent effects will it have on the African American community? This is Bleaching Black Culture. When the Fisk Jubilee singers performed Steal Away to Jesus for Queen Victoria, they inspired the name Music City of the U.S. Earl Tucker popularized a dance called the Snake Hips. Many say he was the father of isolation dance moves that eventually led to pop locking. The Harlem Renaissance was known as the New Negro Movement, and from it flourished icons such as Billie Holiday and a variety of other artists that changed the art world. James Brown's Get Up, Sex Machine, was one of Rolling Stone's 500 greatest songs of all times. It was recorded in two takes. Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight was one of the first songs to popularize rap around the United States. It was preserved into the National Recording Registry by the Library of Congress. Def Jam, founded by Rick Rubin and later joined by Russell Simmons, was one of the first major labels to consistently release hip-hop music. These events are just a few milestones in seven decades that make up what we know today as urban culture. Cultural theft has been, um, and especially when it comes to black culture, as American as apple pie. From the time that we were brought over here on slave ships and our very lives were stolen from us. White people stole their culture from blacks. I mean, they stole blacks. They brought us here. So I can they refer to us as, you know, Negro color, these made-up words, Afro-American, black, all that. You know, I'm not an Afro-American. You have to call it what it is. I'm a stolen African. We saw this in 12 years of slave, where when we weren't singing and dancing to entertain a slave master, uh, we had to fight to the death in this brutal kind of no-holds-barred fighting that went on. But beyond that, black artists have never been properly compensated for their work. If I had to quantify how much America has um, um, has profited from black culture, I would start with uh, slavery and the fact that companies like Lloyd's of London became Lloyd's of London because they insured the slave trade. The first stop that was traded on Wall Street were black slaves. Trillions of dollars, if I had to quantify it with a number. Not billions, trillions. I think what differentiates theft from unification, if you will, or integration, even if you will, or sharing all of this with one another, you know, is whether or not it's being acknowledged who that belongs to. A story that has existed uh, throughout the history of this country, uh, from white artists that put blackface on. Baby, I'm coming. Oh, God. I hope I'm not late. From Elvis Presley, you know, taking us to not just black music, but even a song that had been previously recorded, You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog, and becoming a superstar with it, is indicative of what happens with cultural theft. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Don't do my thing and not give me my share. So that's where it becomes theft. They really like it in Boston. And Pittsburgh, PA. If anybody had an option across the USA It's very difficult for me to take about that shotgun because I lifted every leg you ever to play. So there's people still giving people credit, but they're giving them credit and they're still over there or down there. And you create this together, you're up over here. This is a gentleman that started it with, as far as I'm concerned. I'm giving you shout outs, but I ain't writing you checks. You stole it. You know you stole it. Stop lying. This borrowing concept versus stealing. This mean and yang approach of, of music and ownership that's been around for decades, mm -hmm. it's going to continue. Today, a copyright infringement dispute involving uh, Robin Cook's uh, blurred lines. He himself said he was inspired, just like Elvis Presley said he was inspired. Marvin Gaye's children have settled a portion of their lawsuit regarding the hits on blurred lines and its similarities to Gaye's song, Got to Give It Up. <laughs> In, 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 in black music. You know, people 
people don't even like to use that term black music. That's what it is. Call it what it is. Cool. Let's move on. They're literally taking line by line, beat by beat, our music. What do you call it? Oh, man, you call it stealing. The fact is, it still exists. And the question is, is it fair? The question is, is it even right now? If you're simply just uh, somewhat uh, borrowing or you're somewhat inspired by another person and you are adopting or incorporating certain aspects in their move, it becomes a really slippery slope. The whole world doesn't really know where they got you go with them. Oh, you go with Will I see you at your party tonight? You know you will. You looking all good. You go, boy. <laughs> Little by little, we're blending and merging until one day we're all going to be one united people. Operation Whitewash goes global. I think rap and hip hop as a whole just brought just society kind of together. Hip hop has been such a big influence on the world, and I, I think that's fucking cool. We were looking at it watering down, and Malcolm X talked about this, and he used coffee, for example. You keep putting milk into the coffee, eventually it becomes weaker and weaker, and you put enough milk and enough sugar, and you don't even remember after a while that it was coffee just to begin with. It's problematic when we're going to take on really good aspects of call it ours and say that we're going to be a part of it, but we don't know the history of where a lot of things came from. We weren't a part of the origination of black culture. So I think that we're sort of anger so many black people when you look at black culture being sort of mimicked by white people is that the the, 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 the onus or the ownership is never given back to the rightful owner. People at the top are traditionally older white men. So in their eyes, even though it's our culture and it's making them money, they still want to see their own out front and center. Executives are not looking at it like that. They didn't grow up in the culture. They don't have a, 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 a personal, you know, emotional investment in the culture. It's just a means to an end. People like Justin Bieber and, you know, other, you know, white R&B, uh, rap artists, you know, are positioned as the, 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 the face of rap and R&B. It's not about preserving culture or preserving a legacy or preserving tradition. That's not what it's about. And that's not what it's really ever been about. So what do they do? They find a way to make money. Lemon taste, and I taste, freak lemon taste, it's tough. Hey, yo, Chris, what's up, love? What's that in your hand? It's a S to the P-R-I-T-E-N. Us buying it is important for authentication. That has enabled us to go ahead and identify with those products, regardless of who made them. Sprite has really become an icon. It's not just associated with hip hop. It, it's, it's really a part of it. As much as baggy jeans and sneakers. Oh no, you didn't. Crisp, clean, ice cold, lemon, lime, Sprite. Oh, is that your ticket tip? Check it out. Nike, for years, they never had a black agency. They never, you know, specialized in quote unquote black marketing, but. They have done an excellent job of having culturally relevant, culturally impactful, you know, commercials. Yo, Mike, what makes you the best player in the universe? Is it the vicious stunts? No, Mars. Is it the haircut? No, Mars. Is it the shoes? No, Mars. It's got to be the shoes. The shoes, shoes, shoes. The shoes. The shoe is not the shoes. Some of the best brands that we've had, you know, have not had a lot of black involvement, but certainly have a good amount of African American uh, usage of the product. It's popular culture, you know, it's used to sell products. My problem is when you're using it to sell anything and, and it, it cheapens the culture, you know, and it's and it's just it's just ugly. It's a matter of who is telling your story. And when it's just record companies and marketing companies and people trying to sell clothing and cologne and beer and energy drinks that are telling our stories, then that's the story that gets told. Urban culture has become so commercial that late night host Jimmy Fallon and Justin Timberlake decided to educate us on the history of hip hop. <laughs> Globally, the hip-hop industry is worth $10 billion. However, white Americans have 22 times more wealth than blacks, a gap that nearly doubled during the Great Recession. I think we should not complain about cultural appropriation. I think we should work hard to find a way to make sure we participate because it is 100% clear. It's 100% clear 
that our culture sells. If a white cat wants to, you know, say R&B, then yeah, cool, you know, whatever. As long as you understand the culture, you respect the history of it. Nobody knocks cats like that. You can look at Tina Marie, right? Did anybody ever really talk trash about Tina Marie? No one questions Tina Marie. Holly Oates, you know, well, you know, the whole Blue Eyes Soul thing, you know, Michael McDonald. These are just artists who love the music that they do, and they, they show it. White people, we ain't trying to brawl. You know we ain't mad at all of y'all. We love Michael McDonald and Daryl Hall. Put your hands up if you're down with the cause. If you're in it for another reason, it's see-through. You can see it, you know, and that's a problem. I don't have a problem with other people digging who I am and who we are and because because uh, it's dope. I think it's flattery. You know, flattery is the utmost respect. There's always been a certain cool about urban culture. And this cool has been embraced, but also misinterpreted by many cultures. Yeah, so, so, so tell me about your all's influence is. Yeah, yeah, I'm down with that. It's like I'm saying, Brent B, we've been influenced by all kinds of white performers who've been influenced by black entertainers. You know? It's like I'm saying, I gotta say my man, Elvis, the king, you know? It's like I'm saying, Vanilla Ice, the original, you know? You're watching the White People Co-opting Black Culture Network. How to give a homey handshake. One, going for a regular handshake, palm to palm. Two, rotate your hand so you are clasping the thumb of your dog's hand. Three, then slide your palms away from each other and grip the fingertips slightly before snapping them apart. Keep practicing until the move becomes smooth and fluid. Wow, you're looking cooler already. Oh, the Beebs is very thug. I don't know if you know this, she's very thug. And if there's one thing that I will always be amused by, it is a rich white suburban kid who thinks he's black. It is a spectacle with Justin Bieber, Little Wayne. Sometimes you have to laugh at Whitey. The industry positions these artists to become the face or the new face of hip hop and r &B. Now that's a problem. Hip hop is, is so worldwide, it's, it's international. Uh, so to put a color on it now at this point in 2014 is, is far beyond um, anybody's reasoning. Woo! Why we're here on the stage right now. The reason I feel like Macklemore won was because it was a different topic. We don't think he should have won the Best Rap Album Award. Macklemore won because he's white. I mean, the Grammys are always going to support a white rapper making pop accessible hip hop. They're like, what? It's a rapper? And he's white? This is great! Oh my god, we hit the jackpot! I can't listen to a lot of stuff today because I know it's there's a goal behind it to tell me to, to be a pop star. But I think that you have people who are always behind the scenes thinking about how we can make a black artist white enough to be accepted or how we can make a, 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 a white artist black enough to really make to really make mega dollars. I feel like we're losing it. You know what I'm saying? I feel like the people that are in control of what hip-hop does is so fucking white and so fucking Jewish until they don't give a fuck about what the culture and the craft and what the what it really is. Stop trying to rape my culture. Go make some money with some other people. Like, stop having your agenda be hip hop. There's a concerted effort, intentional, intentional, to marginalize black artists because of the power of the voice of black artists. They have people that their job is to create beef so that they can monetize it, pause. But they don't let their culture feel it. But they make money from it. And they can't mon make any money or get any respect in their culture. That's why they're in our culture. Because the minute that they were allowed to be there, they would go. In the 90s, Tupac, Public Enemy, and other artists used their voices to uplift the community. When I think about what's happening to the hip-hop artists and the R&B artists in music, I'm not certain if it's marginalization or if it's just a sea change in the business. There's no fucking way that you can tell me it's, that, you, that, that it's not a conspiracy against the blacks in hip-hop. Black music is possibly the most powerful music in the world, going to jazz, going to blues. I mean, we wouldn't have rock with, with black, without black music. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have 
Yeah, <laughs> what else like music? Let's be real about the the impact. You know, during the sixties, I mean, come on, man. You have you know you have cats wearing X hats. You would have an increase in black college enrollment. Not to say that hip hop was the cause of it, but you have this whole kind of climate. You know, conscious hip hop, and not all of the hip hop is conscious, of course. You know, with your two life crews and your two short, but you got your you know your public enemies and your ex clans and your poor righteous teachers. You know, so you have this balance. I just feel fucked up when I. Um a old ass 75 year old dude that ain't never been to the to the neighborhood to you know to embrace this culture uh, or ever to try to dictate what's hot you know and what's not i believe there's an agenda today i can see it all around I think about foods, I think about language, I think about recreation, like dance. When Soul Train hit the air, that was powerful for us because I was like we were trendsetters. You come out and do it with us again next week on these same stations, and you can bet the last money it's all gonna be a stone dance, honey. There was a difference with Aretha Franklin and James Brown because nobody else can do it, but now Timberlake is just as cool. <laughs> gave Justin Timberlake a pass because Justin Timberlake wasn't trying so hard. It was just a soulful way that he was. It wasn't like a, a you know, like an affectation of, of silliness. Black music, R&B, it's dying. It is dying. And nobody can sit up here and tell me that, um, you know, some of our greatest singers of all time should have to die broke. Especially when, you know, other systems are definitely living and thriving, you know, off of our culture. The problem that I have is they make us feel like what we do is terrible. You know, what they did with R&B music has made us feel like it was not good or it wasn't selling. Similar to how they do White Flight. All the black people want to move out to, you know, the suburbs. White people wait till the black folks get in. Then they move right into our hood, right into the city and rebuild the inner city, which, which they really wanted anyway. But they make you feel like it has no value. So what's scary is when we take accountability and then the world accepts us, then we feel some kind of way when they take what we said, this is our culture, we want to, we want you to love and appreciate it like we do. And they say, okay, we do. And they start making money off of it. You can see that it's got that big, thick stem in it. So you just pop it out like that. Now see, Paul, when we grew up, we ate the stem, everything. Really? We didn't cut anything out. So we're talking about uh, soul cooking now as a legitimate form of American celebration. People have taken soul food to sort of mean southern food. Soul food is about an emotional thing. You're cooking for love. You're cooking to make a person feel special. It's our ability to have nothing and to turn it into everything. Soul food was their trash. When you consider the background of soul, you have to go back to the slave trade because the slaves were issued in the old days very, uh, how we put it, cheap cuts of meat from the pig, for instance. They practically live on hogs. And now look at all this, these television shows, it's a delicacy now. By making southern collards with cornmeal dumplings. Our grandmothers cook, they pull that out the ground so you have the soil, the naturalness of it. We took them tiny gravy. You know, you walked over them and we turned them into something that tastes good. That soul food made you feel good or like you could just conquer the world. Whereas now, southern food is just an element. It's just a part of the process. We lay these out just like we would a tobacco leaf. Yep. And then we're just going to roll it yeah, just like this. Some people like they're sliced, very thin. We don't. So we're trying to reach a large audience. So you use those words like southern food to make it more acceptable. But for me, southern cooking is soul food. Now, I know some of you think that soul, which is always associated with black cooking, is not really a, what would we call an American mainstream. Nothing could be farther from the truth. You realize that, that there were black citizens in this culture long before the slave trade uh, occurred. They came, uh, they came from Europe and they came from Africa as, as free citizens hundreds of years ago. And they've been here ever since. The term co-opting frustrates me. 
it's speaking like we are weak in this. Oh my God, our culture is being co-opted. The mean people are taking our culture and they're doing bad things to us. We have enough power as a people. We have enough mental power. You know, we have enough infrastructure to not ever let it be taken. White people take this in the best way. The thing is, is that when young white people uh, do the black thing, these same young white people grow up to be middle-aged white people. They take off the whole black accessory thing and they become white again. It certainly got my foot in the door, allowed me to get to where I'm at today. But um, I, I'm glad that I, I don't do that anymore. You can't pick up black and put it down. Black is something that you are and it is. That's all. Wahlberg has become a powerhouse in the entertainment world. He's an executive producer of three series on HBO. I think that you can look at what's happening in the music business and the film business and see that the heart of those fortunes and those empires have been built on the black artists and black culture. As wrong as it may be, as ridiculous as it may be, to think that this is everything that black culture has to offer is, is, is hip hop. Yeah, it's ridiculous. But guess what? People actually believe it. People all across the world actually believe this to be true. I was reading this article about uh, this whole segment of uh, Japanese kids who love hip hop. Be stylish, that's what they call it. Okay. In this particular culture, the young ladies, they, they paint their faces black and they get suntans and they wear braids and they speak a certain way, a lot of neck turn, a lot of finger pointing. <laughs> Their notions of blackness are always so stereotypical and negative to some degree. We think that sometimes the acceptance of our music means the acceptance of us as a people, and it doesn't. When Julianne Hough decided to be black face and to be Black Panther, she was appropriating black culture, but in a really degrading way. We're saying we want to celebrate it and learn from it. But we're not appropriating any of the negative things. We're not appropriating any hurt that has maybe been done to black culture. Is it, like, bad to do blackface? Is that still, like, a thing? Oh, my God, I'm practically black. Twizzies. <laughs> we can really only appropriate to a certain extent because we don't know the history of where a lot of things came from. You can say the N-word, but I can't. How is that okay? Why is my computer acting so ghetto? This is so ghetto. Ghetto. <laughs> If you are the greatest and the most powerful artist in the world, you are supposed to impact culture in general. When you have shows like America's Best Dance Crew and American Idol, you, you kind of invite those other cultures into, you know, the types of dancing that we have done for so long. I was heavily influenced and tried to, you know, be like what I thought hip-hop was supposed to be and rappers were supposed to be black rappers or like, you know, I tried to be like that. I think that's with anybody trying to be like a certain anything they're into. You're going to go through certain phases and changes where you act like something else to finally pull in those influences from everything to make it who you are. Yeah, they swagger jacket. Yeah, they still in our culture. But you cannot deny that Justin Timberlake ain't jamming. You can't deny that Robert Thicke ain't jamming. You can't deny the fact that Eminem can fucking rap for real. <laughs> is awesome you know our style is awesome we should understand the power of it because at the end of the day that using power and translating it to economic power rewards you you got to flip it you got to flip mode it right so now you got a lot of these black producers who are producing these white cats they have black people beside them or behind them Timbaland does just about everything for Justin Timberlake Justin Bieber has Usher I think it's still black music is just on a different platform if I'm a producer and I go ahead and say, man, I'm producing tracks for this person and this person and this person. Now they make me famous. They blow me up. Now I have the power to go ahead and give that same energy and that same love to who I wanted to give it to in the first place. You feel what I'm saying? T.I. produced Australian hip-hop artist Iggy Azalea. And the two of them have made history when her first two charting singles reached the number one and number two spots on Billboard's Hot 100. This is our safe haven. The cave in which we hibernate and create magic that we are now ready to present to you. Yeah, and we don't leave unless you pass a lot of money. Third of this. Peace.
got him queasy. Get these souls a hard time, make it look easy. I'm the first of my kind, you ain't seen it. She's incredibly insane. It takes a special to Un back. Unbelievably belligerent. And you know what? And we're going to make millions upon millions until billions of dollars off of it. Although many say that cultural appropriation is flattery, at what point does admiration become mockery? African Americans have been twerking since the 90s, but it wasn't until Miley Cyrus twerked at the awards that twerking became a word in the dictionary. It feels to me like everybody acted like Miley made up twerking. Okay. And I've been watching you twerk. I don't know why people weren't, they weren't outraged when you were twerking. I don't know. You've been twerking for a long, long hey, time. Hey, 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 work, work, work. No, you know, it's the white girl thing. Mm -hmm. How long has twerking been something that people have been doing? Because I, I didn't know so much about it. I shot a movie in New Orleans like two years ago, and that's when I became fascinated and obsessed. It was because I got to go to a twerk show, and then I saw it and was just like... There's I a just, twerk show? I just couldn't believe it. I can't believe it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a seminar. Uh, I love it. <laughs> no, seriously, if a white girl does something that seems to be like black, then it's like black people think, oh, she's embracing our culture, so they kind of ride with it. And then white people think, oh, she must be cool. She do it on black. So it's, it's weird. But if a black person do a black thing, it ain't that popping. Uh, I can't sing, I can't act, I'm dumb, I'm a hillbilly, but I can twerk, so whatever. They're mad at Molly for putting twerking in the dictionary. They're mad at Molly Cyrus for doing the map. Be happy that Molly put that in there. If you look at the force that black Twitter is, when black Twitter does not like something, it's on, you know? Something is going to change because they're gonna they're gonna go in. It's part of a phenomenon called black Twitter. Go with me here. Not all black Twitterers are black, and not all black people who tweet are part of black Twitter. But those who are, tweet often about race, pop culture, and issues that interest the black community. A magazine the other day um, spoke of cornrows and acted in the editorial like it was a new style. It was a bold, innovative style. And, you know, black Twitter was like, no, no, no. They appreciate authenticity. They, they appreciate what's genuine. They appreciate what's real. White rappers, you're coming to this almost as a guest. Okay? Matter of fact, you are guests in the house of hip-hop. Black people, white people, Asian people, people all over the world have been to this house, lived in it, used it, abused it, fixed it up. Fucking, you know, it, it is now a different home. It doesn't matter who laid the first brick. If you're coming into my house to steal from me, or if you're coming into my house just to put your flag down and then call this your house, we got a problem. So don't come in my house talking that bullshit. Whether you agree with being guests in hip-hop, you might not agree with that, and I don't expect everybody to. To me, you kind of, kind of are guests in hip-hop. If you want to learn how to play the guitar, you're probably going to study those who came before you. You know, you have your legends, you have your icons, you respect them. When it comes to rap, cats act like you can just pick up the mic or pick up the pad and the pen, and here you are. You're, you're an artist. So don't come in my house talking that bullshit. I think the people that are offended probably just, maybe just as simple as finding it annoying. Like, man, I talk like this, I act like this because I've been through certain things. Do you not love the culture enough? Like, you claim to be passionate about this thing enough for you to pick it up and to do it. What's wrong with investing some time into something that you claim to love? You can say what you want, but the Beastie Boys, they made hip-hop move. They were one of the first albums, hip-hop albums, to go platinum. Eminem was one of the first artists to get played on the hit format radio station. Stations that played a lot of the popular songs, but they played no hip-hop. Is that his fault? You know? No. You have a rapper like uh, Action Bronson, who I actually like. You drop your pants, get your ankles at the urinal like the ball game. I'm on the school getting brain from a tall day. But everybody knows he sounds like Ghostface, right? I don't touch that spot. I want that unnecessary beat. You smoke garbage, bust. You smoke too. People that look up to Action Bronson now, who are probably young white kids, are going to think he's the father of the style. They might start copying him. 
not even never knowing about there was a ghost face. So if you respect the culture, learn about it. Take pride in it. That, that's all I'm saying. Just take pride in it like you would anything else. So don't come in my house talking that bullshit. You go all around the world and people who are usually connected with culture are uh, some of the most giving people. Musically, uh, socially, mentally, we are giving everything away. We have thrown away, we have thrown away more cultural assets than most people have had ever. Again, from hip hop culture to, uh, you know, when people have taken African beats and Brazilian beats and Afro-Cuban beats and scored movies with them and made hit records with them and not compensated the source of where that comes from. In 1939, Solomon Linda, a South African Zulu musician, singer and composer, wrote the song in Mbumbe, which later became the popular success, The Lion Sleeps Tonight. In the 1950s, American musicologist Alan Lomax discovered the original. He then gave it to his friend, folk musician Pete Seeger and the Weavers. It was popularized by the Weavers. They recorded a studio version in 1952, which became a top 20 hit in the USA and later licensed to Disney for The Lion King. The song earned an estimated 15 million for its use in The Lion King alone. Solomon Linda lived and died in poverty. After years of fighting, his estate sued Disney and Abilene Records and finally won in 2004. In 2006, the Linda Ayers began receiving payments for past uses of The Lion Sleeps Tonight and entitlement to its future royalties from its worldwide use. Yes, it's one of the easiest things to steal because we're so giving. The great thing to do is go get that person and allow them to produce you allow them to be a part of the process see that's the problem that's when it becomes theft when you take and that person diminishes it's our music but most of the people in there they don't look like us so the the, the beauty and even the evolution and the expansion of this art form is even being shared by cultivated by funded and profited by people who don't look like where it came from that that's absolutely unfair stop making excuses for white people to to act like they're black because there's no excuse for it unless they paid their dues people start getting shot in the back by police and hung just for being white they can do all the hip-hop they want <laughs> Keeping black folks in their place was the law of the land. We were much more independent about making sure that we had black institutions that mattered and that we were going to make sure that from generation to generation that we as a people knew who we were. Back in the day, we had certain leaders. And then there was a national campaign that kind of made you more aware and to be embracing and proud of what was considered your culture. We gonna pull and plug for our people. Decent house and fit for shelter human beings. We're going to lead it in to police brutality and murder black people. So we had an image of success that was linked to all of your people being free. In other words, I'm not free unless all of my folks are free. I'm not successful unless we are all doing well. Now you have a culture, a black culture, that holds up certain people as superstars, whether it's sport, whether it's entertainment, or politics. <laughs> So the urban culture is used to make millions. What we're saying is that we want to use urban culture, reclaim that revolutionary part of it, and use it to move millions. We can't expect white people or any other race of people to respect us when we don't respect ourselves. When I look at the images that we're putting out there, when I look at the lyrics, listen okay, the lyrics I, I know you're going, right. Of the songs, they're like, hell, they don't respect them themselves. Why the hell should we? <laughs> Why is it okay to, 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 to show such blatant disrespect and, 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 and hate, you know, for black people and black men and black women? We just take any kind of crap out there. Nobody's protesting anymore. Nobody's making any noise. How many times are we saying to that network, you show this foolishness one more time? When you speak about misappropriation of the culture, you're generally speaking about people who are not black misappropriating the culture. But what do we say about people who are black who misappropriate the culture? You better get some life insurance on your child, boy, what I tell you, because shit get real ratchet these days, nigga, and slump roll hype, but we get real ratchet, nigga. What do we say? 
we say nothing. The FCC is there to regulate that, and they do when it fits their agenda. All the beautiful things that we were so proud of, they've forgotten about. Because we hope we have a black president now, that is no longer racism, no. It's a whole new generation with not having those issues, and so in turn, he just resonates that kind of message that we're all one and everything to afford. I never voted in my life. I ain't seen a goddamn thing to vote for. I'm gonna vote this time for a time for Obama. You know what's one thing he said? He's gonna try to get some justice for black men. Every now and then we'll have a movement of black film. Sweet Sweetback's badass song. Uh, generated in the 70s. It was the first real black independent film to do well. Melvin Van Peebles wrote and directed that film. <laughs> And it led to a wave of black cinema, and black people went to the theater and flocked to it because they were hungry to see positive images and real images of themselves. And then Jaws came out. And when Jaws came out, and Hollywood began to see that those same black dollars would go for these big movies, and then they tried a couple more, Star Wars and The Exorcist, they said, well, why do we have to pay so much attention to that? They will spend their money there anyway. The so-called liberals that are in Hollywood now are not as good as their parents or ancestors. Because they're not racist. <laughs> they're not racist. They grew up with hip-hop, so you can't be racist. I like Jay-Z, mm. but that don't mean I gotta give you a job. Mm. Every time we have this wave, there's another economic model that's put out, and now we're in, you know, the era of the big tentpole, you know, superhero movies. People that look at those box office receipts says, those same black dollars, those same urban dollars are coming to see these big action movies. Why do we have to put up money for these black films? The black films now, so-called black films now, are, they're great. They're great films, but they're just product. They're, they're not moving the bar forward when you try to make it homogenized, when you try to make it try to make it appeal to everybody, but you don't have anything that's special. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't made for everybody. Mm -hmm. It was made for like a young black audience that, that buys hip-hop records. But I knew that if I got as universal as possible, it would cross over. There's that motherfucker that was talking shit the other night. Okay. When I say cut, we're gonna cut through these houses, okay? Gotcha. It's not that I'm saying, oh, you're of a different background, you can't do this thing. I'm saying that if you're gonna do it, have enough respect, like people who have done it successfully. There's people that do it very, very well. Taylor Hafford did a great job on the way. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever anybody wants to say about Steven Spielberg, so he watched, watched what Brian Hill did on 42. They did a good job because they have respect for the thing. They didn't do anything and say, I'm going to tell a story and I'm not going to give nobody black a job. I still think it comes back to us. When other races and other cultures capitalize off our images and our history and our roots, I think we're to blame. We don't capitalize off ourselves. We don't create our own content. We don't create our own brands and images, and we, we put it in the hands of other people to create. What's interesting is today, there's that one black show. And they won't give you the opportunity. He came along and said, and sold them and then single a bunch of others. We did something that was great, that changed people's lives. It can't be duplicated. We use our culture and we use our influence mm -hmm. to, for your benefit and then you don't pay us back. There's too many ways to go direct to, to, to consumer nowadays where we don't have to whine about co-opting. Co-opting comes when, in the days when the distribution outlets were fragmented and smaller. We are not victims idly waiting for them to tell us what we can watch. So I'm doing the best I can to be the best I can, ideally that ripples out and trickles out and, and ideally you set that example for other people who look like you and who don't. I see the fact that we have phenomenal artists, phenomenal performers. I see it being emulated. I see people trying to tap, tap into the magic formula that we have. You could go ahead and bring out 700 women and not make another Beyonce. So I feel like our culture is getting its rightful place. One of the main reasons why I can get up every day and walk with my shoulders back in my chin is because yeah. <laughs> if we say that only black people should be able to make black culture, then the flip side is true. And only white people should be able to make white culture. Are we prepared to accept the corollary of what we're asking? And we're not, because the talent we have is too prodigious. Since we now have, 
you know, hip hop artists who might have been in jail a few years ago dealing drugs with now millionaires and some people might be approaching the half billion or the billion dollar mark. It's certainly a multi billion dollar industry. You've seen Jay Z on different things, you've seen him on BET, you've seen him on MTV, but when Jay Z was on 60 Minutes, that was a moment of affirmation. Rap music isn't just about the mean streets anymore, it's just as much about Wall Street. And the audience is overwhelmingly white. And 33 year old Jay Z is the reigning king of rap. He's living the 21st century version of the American dream, straight out of the hood. Beyonce at the inauguration, those things are important. Uh, those are signposts that the culture is moving in the correct direction. Black people have hard feelings about what's going on, and we should definitely not get over it. We should take those hard feelings and turn them into hard action. Where we should be more um, agitated is on the economic side of all these things. If you go back and study in history, they have always come to Timbuktu. They've always come to, 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 to Egypt. They've always come to African and black people to learn, to get science, to get mathematics. It's so much bigger than music. We can't be afraid to play by the rules and even if that means establishing new rules. You get commercial success and then you think that's all you are. We don't chase pop. Pop chases us. Black culture moves arts, science, and technology into the future and is a significant thread in the tapestry of America. Lack of acknowledgement and proper accolades do not change the fact that African Americans, past and present, will forever continue to influence a nation. Thank you. 